So I want to describe, I'm just going to scoot over that there, one project that has just been completed and just been written up and submitted on multiple myeloma as an example of the sorts of things that are still there to learn. So multiple myeloma, about 20,000 new diagnoses per year in the United States. It's a malignancy of plasma cells, and it's characterized by massive secretion of immunoglobulins. And that massive secretion of, of immunoglobulin proteins is relevant, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. So what we did, and we as Todd Golub and uh, Mike Chapman and Mike Lawrence and others and Getty Getz, was sequence the whole genome of 23 tumor normal pairs and the whole exome of 16 tumor normal pairs. So the landscape looks like this. There's about three mutations per million base. It's a little higher than the average of about one that you see in many cancers, but lower than what you see in others like melanoma. Um, there's about 35 non-silent amino acid changing uh, coding mutations. And there's about 21 on average chromosomal rearrangements per sample. And you get some genes that have one mutation. In fact, most genes have at least one mutation somewhere. About 100 genes have two. Three genes have three mutations. Three genes have four, et cetera. Now, how do you make sense out of any of these? Which of these matter in some fundamental way? Well, to sort through a list of mutations, you can look for a couple of things. Genes that on their own, just as an individual gene, have a statistically significant frequency of mutation. One gene has eight mutations. You do the arithmetic right, yes, that's highly significant. You could look for genes that don't have so many mutations, but you see an identical mutation across patients. Or you could have genes that have a known role already in cancer, using here a hypothesis-driven approach. And then you can also look at not individual genes, but sets of genes, and ask, are there too many mutations in this set? So those are your tricks. For individual genes with statistically significant frequencies of mutation, you have to correct for the size of the gene, the base composition of the gene, set some false discovery rate. And when you do that for this multiple myeloma data set, this is what you, what you see. You find 10 highly significant genes. Four are previously known, NRAS, KRAS, P53, CCND1. Six are new. How do we know that these are real? Well, that they're important. One easy way is you can assign every mutation a functional significance based on how much it changes a conserved amino acid and in what way. And it's clear that those genes that have multiple hits in it show much higher functional significant changes. They affect more conserved amino acids or make more significant changes to those amino acids. So that gives you a good feeling that this probably matters. Um, let's take two genes in particular. FAM46C and DIS3, the first two of the unknown genes. What are they and what do they tell us? Well, DIS3, there are four separate mutations. DIS3 encodes an endonuclease component to the exosome, and the exosome is highly conserved all the way down to E. coli. The exosome has multiple roles, including degrading mRNAs and tRNAs. The four mutations cluster in there in the picture in one, around one little pocket of this protein. And every one of those residues is highly conserved down to yeast and to E. coli. In fact, two of these four mutations have been made in yeast and E. coli, and we know their function. Two of them, just before, you know, adventitiously, have been made. One of them leads to the significant accumulation of initiator tRNAs. And it's known from separate experiments that relatively modest increases in initiator tRNAs are capable of transforming fibroblasts. The other is known to completely abolish the exonuclease activity. And so the hypothesis here is that DIS3 increases protein translation through increasing the uh, initiator tRNA and through the loss of the exonuclease activity that degrades RNA. So that's a hint that protein uh, translation may be affected. FAM46C, five mutations, what is it? If you type it into PubMed, it comes back zero instances found in PubMed. But if you just take its gene expression pattern across tissues and run it against all other genes, it's a slam dunk match in its gene expression pattern for all the genes involved in the ribosomal protein module. It is perfectly co-regulated with ribosomal proteins. What it does, I don't know, but I'd bet very good money this is involved in ribosomal proteins. And if we take together this three, and FAM46C, 
We also see single mutations in a ribosomal protein gene, ribosomal protein 10, in the ribosomal protein kinase S6, in initiation factor 3A, in XBP1 that is involved in the unfolded protein response, and in which mouse mutations actually cause multiple myeloma, but mutations had not previously been identified, and in LURK2, a gene known in Parkinson's disease, and it invo it's involved in phosphorylating initiation factor 4E. A, a binding protein. So there's a whole story here about protein uh, translation and stability that emerge from those mutations. And now lots of hypotheses and lots of work to do. Now you could also look for any instances where you see exactly the same mutation occurring twice. And that indeed occurs too. IRF4, interferon regulatory factor 4, has mutations in two cases and they're the identical mutation, a K123R mutation which is a hallmark of kind of a gain of function in many oncogenes. Never been previously reported in multiple myeloma, but recently it was proposed to be a potential oncogene in multiple myeloma based on SHRNA screens that knock out the gene and have selective uh, lethality to myeloma lines, but not to other cancer cell lines. Now, IRF4 regulates PRDM1, which is a transcription factor involved in plasma cell differentiation, and two of our patients have mutations, this time different mutations, in PRDM1. So there's another story that emerges in there. Then there's the just genes that are, play known roles in cancer. Single instances, but you know, not statistically significant on their own, but you shouldn't turn your nose up at them. BRAF. There's a BRAF mutation in one of the patients. BRAF is, of course, important in other cancers, and the particular mutation that was seen in this patient is a known activating allele of BRAF, although not the one that the Plexicon drug is made against, but one that could be susceptible to other BRAF inhibitors. And when you just go and look now in a collection of additional multiple myeloma patients and you just genotype them for 12 known activating BRAF alleles, you find that 7% of multiple myeloma patients have these BRAF mutations. So singles can be good. Then. There's gene sets, not individual genes being significant, but a set of genes being significant. And you can get your sets in one of two ways, a prior hypothesis about a candidate gene set, your favorite gene set, or an unbiased search against the collection of gene sets. Prior hypothesis. Well, the NF-kappa B pathway is known to be activated in a number of multiple myeloma cell lines. And the basis for that is poorly understood, although there are one or two cases in which you know, TRAF3 mutation uh, is known to do it. So you make a candidate gene set here of 58 genes previously defined in the NF-kappa B pathway. You look, you get a highly statistically significant result with mutations in 10 genes and translocations in, uh, in five more cases. About 39% of patients now have identifiable mutations in the NF-kappa B pathway, suggesting a broader role for the NF-kappa B pathway. Histone methyl transferase pathways. Oops, that should have gone away at the bottom there. Um, it's known in acute leukemias that HOXA9 is activated by demethylation, for example, through MLL mutations. Well, we went and looked, and HOXA9 also shows high expression in multiple myeloma. That is, this is the chromatin silencing of HOXA9, and the chromatin silencing goes away in many multiple myeloma cell lines there. And this is especially true in the cases that don't have the common translocations. Now, the first case we looked at had a mutation in MLL2. It had been previously reported that 15% of myelomas harbor mutations in WHSC1, uh, another uh, histone methyl transferase. And recently, a UTX point mutation had been reported. So we made a gene set of the WHSC1 family, UTX family, and the MLL family. And when you do that, you get a highly significant result, I should say, eliminating the cases we use to make the hypothesis and only looking in the other samples. Um, and 19% of the patients have mutations here in the histone methyl transferase. Is this working through HOXA9 demethylation? Well, one way to do it would be to take multiple myeloma cell lines in which the HOXA9 is turned on and ask whether it's essential by knocking down HOXA9. And the answer is, it is that knockdown of HOXA9 in those cell lines, in fact, leads to significant decrease in viability of those cell lines. Now, these were known gene sets. What about new gene sets? Could we scan the database of 
you know, msigdb, our database of pathways, and identify new gene sets? And the answer is yes. And one comes up as highly significant. The coagulation factor pathway, the thrombin pathway. That's a little weird. Um, thrombin's supposed to be around to make clots and things like that. What's it doing here? And, uh, but yet 16% of cases have mutations in the thrombin pathway here. Well, thrombin, in addition to causing clots, is mitogenic through the PAR1 receptor and possibly other receptors. And so the hypothesis here, not proven by any means, but highly significant, is that this may be acting at least locally by putting out, by increasing the amount of thrombin and then having a auto-mitogenic effect through that. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that emerge by looking at it. You get all sorts of biological insights, known mutations uh, in, in you know, genes you're not at all impressed by, KRAS, NRAS, P53, all kind of obvious, but lots of new things emerge or deeper pictures of a lot of other things emerge. And of course, since we have 20 odd whole genomes, you could even look at non-coding regions and ask, any non-coding regions emerge? And the answer is yes. 18 regions across the genome emerge as being significant with respect to a density of non-coding mutations. Four of these occur in genes that themselves have point mutations in their coding regions. Three of them occur in one gene that's a GPCR, two of them in another gene that's a GPCR, and these two genes are close homologs of each other. Can't prove it's important, but it looks mighty suspicious. And there's five mutations that are occurring in the neighborhood of BCL7A, which is a putative uh, tumor suppressor gene disrupted in Burkitt's lymphoma. So this may be the first evidence of non-coding mutations playing a role here in these genome-wide screens, at least. Anyway, what, what's to do now? Well, there's lots of hypotheses that emerge to test. By no means am I against the hypothesis business. I mean, it's a great business. But where do hypotheses come from? We're in the hypothesis generating business, and there are an awful lot of good hypotheses. And this is a mere 40-odd samples that have been sequenced. One really wants to sequence hundreds of samples and look deeply at what's going on there. So that's one example of where genomics and cancer are talking to each other. 